Namaskar. The last person who speaks at the end of the morning at, at a big disadvantage. You've missed your tea, you're wondering about lunch. I hope I will not bore you too much or for very long. But this is a special occasion for me and I am very appreciative to the organising committee for asking me to speak to you today. It's a very special occasion because we are honouring Professor Mishra, who has been a friend of mine and a colleague for many years. Uh, I have been coming backwards and forwards to work in Nepal for more than 30 years and we have been good colleagues and all these gentlemen here on the platform, and alas, they are all still gentlemen. We still have to have the professorial ladies. A gender change must take place, but these are all very good friends of mine. So I'm appreciative uh, of being here. I want first to really emphasize the value of the work that Professor Mishra has undertaken. And I noticed there are a number of papers this morning which, or this afternoon, which will explicitly discuss his work. I have myself read a great deal of what he has written, and I disagree with quite a lot of what he has written, as well as agreeing with it. I think Nepal, as my friends and I wrote once a long time ago, Nepal in crisis in 1980, Nepal is still in crisis. Uh, I don't want to be rude about the programming, but the fact that the program was written, but we have not adhered to the program, but it has taken a great deal longer, reminds me of the discussions of the constituent assemblies and the discussions about the future of Nepal. It is a very important time now as we come towards the last moments for the construction of a constitution for a new Nepal. And many of us have very mixed feelings about where that process is now. But before I go on, I should apologize first for speaking in English and not in Nepali. But as I was told at a recent discussion at Martin Chotri, I shouldn't apologize just for not speaking in Nepali. I should apologize for not speaking in Sherpa or Tamil or uh, Tama or Maithili or Bhojpuri or Awadi. There are many differences in Nepal, and these differences have become of greater and greater political significance, particularly, as you know, in the last 20 years. The classical sociologists, and I shall pretend to be a sociologist today, talked about social structure and transformation. Karl Marx, Max Weber, Emil Durkheim, the great names that I guess you're familiar with, talked about the transition from a society in which you had your identity made for you at birth and the change from that to a society where you could develop your own identity or where your identity could be enhanced and made more flexible a move from status to contract, from ascribed to achieved. Now that historical transition continues and has not been achieved. Not yet in Nepal, not yet in my country. There is a very big difference between having your identity ascribed to you by others and your ability to create your own identity under conditions maybe not of your own choosing. Karl Marx talked about history being made by men, and he could have said today by men and women, but not under conditions of their own choosing. Identity, which has become very important in the debate about politics, is also something that we construct, but not under the conditions of our own choosing. There is a dialectical interaction between what we make of ourselves and what others make of us. I'm speaking to you as a sociologist at the moment because this is a conference on sociology, but my first degree was in archaeology and history. My PhD is in social anthropology. I ended my career at the universities as a professor of politics, and now I see myself as a broad social scientist concerned with problems of social transformation. And while I've heard a number of very good speeches this morning about the history and development of sociology, something of which you should be very proud, 
I personally am not convinced that sociology should be separate from social anthropology, or from history, or from politics, or from economics. These are arbitrary divisions. We can adopt these identities on some occasions, as I am doing now, or we can parade them in other ways on other occasions. When we book, wrote our book on the Parling crisis, three of us, a geographer, an economist, and a sociologist, wrote a book that was really a political economy of Nepal. So these identities are fluid to some extent, but they are also imposed upon us. I don't want to take too much time, and thank you for the introduction of music, that's lovely. <laughs> I want to just draw attention to the fact that identity is a central part. If you look at your programs, and I was very impressed by Ram Chetri referring to the um, the, the, the poem by Ravindranath Nath Tagore that um, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls. I come probably looking around as the only non-Nepali here. But sociology is an international and transnational subject. So is history, so is politics. We can engage now and must engage with the rest of the world. And those of you who are students and professors in Nepal have, I know, many contacts with friends all over the world. Let me go back to the question of identity. In the description of your programme, on the first page, Sociology of Nepal, it says, I'll just read very briefly, you can look at it, State and society in Nepal are undergoing rapid and epochal transformation on many fronts. This has local and global contexts. Nepal's increasing incorporation into global economy, the developmental discourses of human rights, development and social, insurgency in the peace process, efforts at constitution making, which I spoke about, and resultant debates on identity and state restructuring, this is really an important phase. But it ends that Nepal has entered a capitalist phase. I won't pursue this in great detail, but this seems to me very debatable. Nepal is part of a capitalist world, but is Nepal capitalist? This is a debate that I see Mr. Lutel takes up in reference to discussions that uh, Chaitanya Ramisha has produced, and takes exception to the idea that Nepal is capitalist, suggesting that there are many different relations of production and exchange in the rural areas. So the state of Nepal, now Nepal's identity, is very much a question for debate. From the outside, its identity at the moment is constructed in many ways. Uh, there are many people outside Nepal who do not know what Nepal is or where it is. I think a recent entertainer, Indian entertainer, thought that Everest was Indian. Those of you who have been watching the papers might have seen that. I have many colleagues who, who really do not know whether Nepal is a developing country or a least developed country, an LDC, a capitalist country, or a semi-feudal country, or what? These are open for debate. But I want to emphasize at this point, and I'm cutting out a lot of what I might have said for sake of courtesy, at the moment, Nepal stands at a threshold. The question of Nepal's identity is very much under debate. What will the new Nepal be? Certain agreements have been reached, and other agreements have not been reached. It seems, and it seemed until recently, that one of the major fait accompli in Nepal, and it was referred to earlier, is the transition from a Hindu monarchy to a secular republic. But there are many, and it seems to me as I read the papers and talk to people, a growing number, who would wish to reverse that who are very worried about what a secular state may be in Nepal and are asking or demanding that it return to being a Hindu state. This is a, a very crucial debate that is unresolved. And yet, the comprehensive peace agreement, the interim constitution and previous governments who agreed that Nepal should be a secular republic. But what does secular mean? I think some people feel that this dissolves some of the crucial identities of Nepal, that it makes it a non-religious state, whereas in fact the vast majority of the population 
or Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim or Sikh or other religions and that there is a danger that secular means atheistic, unbelieving. Now the historical Marxist tradition is one of atheism. But I don't see that the Maoists, whether it's the UCPNM or the CPNM or any other possible Marxist group, see themselves as atheists. Uh, Pushpa Dahal himself worships, they see himself as a Hindu. The relationship between Marxism, and Maoism and atheism is very problematic. And most people in Nepal, I believe, are still deeply religious in one way or another. And yet there is a concern about what secularism is. Now let me say what I feel, in a modern sense, in a sense of transformation, secularism must mean for Nepal. And it's not for me to impose, but to suggest some possibilities. One is that the ascribed status that seems to be so important and dominant in the debates about freedom be questioned again. Janajati have emerged certainly over the last 20 years as people who see themselves as relatively disinherited, as wanting their rights. But they speak only as Janajati on an ethnic basis. But what about the rights of people who are not ethnic groups? What about women who may be across all ethnic groups? What about Madesis, people who live in the Terai? Ah, oh, that's another identity that has emerged in the last five to ten years. I remember for ten years back, People didn't talk about Madash, it was the Tarai, it was a region. And it was full of people who spoke Bhojpuri, Awadi, Maitili, there were people who saw themselves as Chepan, as Rante, as uh, Yadav, as uh, Taru, or whatever. Now that has been dissolved into one language of Madash. And yet there are dissident voices within that community. Mary Taru would refuse to be part of a singular Madash. And so that there is accommodation between Madash and Tarua. These identities, however, are not fixed, okay? You don't have to take these as the defining attributes of a human being, a political person, a social person in Nepal. One of the reasons I find the federal debate and the debates around ethnicity and class as a deciding or defining factor is that it identifies one major facet of human identity. It privileges one kind of identity over others. Now, I'm a foreigner, I'm British, I'm English, I live in Norfolk, I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm a son, I'm many, many things, I'm a sociologist. I have multiple identities. And personally, I would refuse to have my identity signified by one kind of attribute alone. My suggestion is that in looking at transformation in Nepal today and considering identity, we emphasize the importance of creating our own identities, having the freedom to do that, and to reject any kind of political or social imposition of one kind of identity rather than another. Now, in my country, a number of groups, and I'll just be brief on this, have been struggling over the last decades to achieve new identities in areas that perhaps seem very unfamiliar. When I look at my passport, one of the first things I have to sign when I look at my ID, my identity, is whether I'm male or female. That may seem very obvious. Sorry, I have a beard, I look a certain way and so on. But in my country, and I think in Nepal also, there is a very strong movement of people growing, who reject this very easy definition of gender and sexuality. Lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transsexuals, the LBGT community, wants the right to be able to define their own sexual and gender identity for themselves and not to have it attributed. So even the most basic, physical, one might have thought natural attributes of identity can be challenged and people are finding that emancipatory, but it's also threatening. Because people begin to challenge the, as the ascribed or given identities, then they become a threat. If someone who is told from birth, you are a Dalit, you are a caste, you are untouchable, that remains the case all of their lives. But if that is challenged, 
not only given, if you like, the rights of Dali, but the rights of people not to be Dali but to be something else. In my view, that is emancipation and that is transformation. So in the construction of identity, there is this dialectic between one's own internal capacity to generate the identity you want or the identities that you want to present and the fact that society will always try to impose certain other identities. That's a struggle, but in my view it's an emancipatory struggle. And all, as all of you think over the next few months about the future of Nepal, whether it should be federal or unitary, whether it should be Hindu or Buddhist or multi-religious or secular, whether you think it should be divided up or not. Think about the capacity of people to generate their own identities and the importance of human rights, not the right to be a Dalit or to be a woman or to have your rights represented as such, but to have your human rights represented, then I think Nepal will be moving out of crisis. Thank you. Thank you.